Um, I want to tell you about a jam I've been working on for the past couple of months. It's called Visualize Ruby. Can you ever hear of anybody? Yep. Awesome. Right there. I just want to talk about a company I just started working for. This was actually my first day there. Uh, it's Alview. They're an ed tech finance company. They help uh, they help K through 12 uh, school districts uh, budget and allocate the resources. Some work remotely for them. They work in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. They might be hiring in the future. Yeah, so I'm just going to give a, like a high level overview here. Most of us. If you're trying to explain something, you might scribble on a whiteboard, uh, throw on some diagrams, kind of communicate something to either uh, technical people or non-technical people. The kind of the thing I want to throw out is, what if from your, what if your code could do that automatically for you? Your code just, the way it is, could somehow produce, uh, could display the logic in a visual format. Give a little background and kind of what uh, got me to this thinking and some experiences I had in my previous company, Review Financial. So, uh, generally, requirements come in and get written by a product. And uh, that goes to the main thing, which is writing code. And another thing that we had in that company was we had some form of documentation. It was, it was a, Review Financial was a, it's a lending company. Um, so there was, there was basically a set of lending criteria, and that needed to be documented for, for lots of reasons. And so, so the code, you know, that was the, the main driver. Uh, that would get worked, worked on, it would always happen, but the documentation uh, would sometimes be an afterthought, and sometimes it would be that the, the code would be the documentation, and, I might get an email from somebody that says, hey, what does this rule do? So I'd have to look up in the code and write out an email and describe what's happening. Uh, because our documentation uh, usually ended up looking like this. Uh, it, it was quite stale. It was, it was a Google Doc that they would maybe update sometimes, not others. Maybe this, this specific rule was a year old or something. Yeah, so again, the code is primarily for the customers. That's who you're writing it for, who's ever using your application. The documentation is for uh, auditors, uh, internal and external, external and uh, also you have the business. The business would need to understand what exactly the system does for, for marketing purposes, uh, also for, for tweaking, and enhancing things, uh, and so they could initially just write some requirements. So, we take, what are we going to do with kind of this move? What if we just kind of reverse that flow in an automated fashion? Um, we always, I always get the requirements, and it works sometimes to get those. Uh, well fleshed out, but eventually you, you got it, you got it in the code, you know, maybe somebody poked at it to make sure it was right. Uh, but once you know the code's right, what if that could lead into, not, not being the primary focus of your code, what if that could lead into some doc, documentation that has visual elements, and in this case these flowcharts. This is kind of that same thing, so your, your primary thing is the customers, and then you kind of have these secondary side channels that uh, uh, support these other, other needs in the business. Uh, so this is kind of the direction uh, Renew Financial went, was, is going, uh, was going months ago when I was there. Uh, the requirements were that they, they wanted to have a visual programming environment. Uh, so you know the business could could have all those needs. They could understand and visualize what was going on. So they they chose with this uh, product. Uh, it's called Provenir. It was highly specialized for the financial domain, and uh, so it was good for them in some ways. 
but it was uh, you know uh, integrated uh, proprietary uh, vendor, uh, so it would not be in Ruby. And I didn't really much care for it, but it really didn't matter because uh, uh, shortly after that, uh, the company had major market uh, ill effects that required a bunch of people to get laid off. Um, so yeah, but I can totally see the benefit from this. And I, I saw this and I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if we could get the, get the benefits of having this visual this uh, visualizing of the business the business logic um, without ha without having to, to go to some private um, external vendor, but still right in Ruby. That's what we all love is Ruby. That's what we're hearing. So, so that's where my gem comes in. Visualize Ruby. Um, just kind of a backstory. I kind of I initially kind of scratched out this gem. It was really ugly, and fortunately, I kind of I lost that code, which I was kind of mad about that a little bit. But then I just took it as, hey, I I, I did something that was cool. Now I can write it better. Uh, which thinking about that, like a lot of things, uh, when you're spiking something, it's really hard to throw something away. Uh, but there's really good benefits uh, sometimes just throwing away, starting over at least initially, uh, that you don't get, you, you, uh, you take real ownership of your code, you don't want to throw it away. It's kind of nice that somebody almost forced me to throw it away. So, uh, flowchart. Flowchart is just a type of diagram that represents an algorithm or flow. Here, this just represents, you know, a decision, even a true or false, some action. So, here's some code, and it produces, it can produce uh, that flowchart. So those things are equivalent. Uh, so kind of the goal of this gem is you don't really have to change your code, you shouldn't have to change it at all, to produce something that looks uh, somewhat visually appealing and uh, helps you visualize uh, control flow and different things like that. So I'm going to go into a few of the tools that I use to make this. Because uh, this, is, this is all very automated. One tool I used was a gem called Parser. It um, breaks everything down into an AST. If you don't know what an AST is, it's just a, it's an abstract, abstract syntax tree. So it's just a step that Ruby takes. Uh, so if you're running your program, uh, one of the steps to actually running the program is converting it into this abstract syntax tree. And just to give you a concrete example of what that looks like. For example, we've got the Ruby code, two plus two. And so uh, this, uh, this gem parser would produce this type of uh, AST. And it's kind of like Lisp if you're familiar with that. So there's a lot of parentheses. Um, but we have we have a node, a uh, node type which is send. And then we have the object that method is being uh, that is the being sent upon. And then we have a method, uh, which is the plus, and then we have the arguments, which is the institute. And so another way of thinking that is uh, to not send send the send the message of plus argument two. So there's a ton of different node types. One of them again, you know, send. Uh, I just went to here because actually these are the most complex ones that I have to deal with. Begin is just it's just a it just wraps two or, or two or more lines of Ruby code, and then if uh, it has you know, it has your branch, it has your true condition, and your false condition. Okay. okay. This goes a little in the weeds. Um, 
this is basically uh, just showing a little bit of the code, how, how it worked. It, it basically took this, it converted the Ruby code into some AST, and it has a node type. And uh, each of those node types corresponds to a Ruby class that knows how to deal with those types. And it also is very, it's recursive in nature, so it, uh, there's a main parser class that deals with these things, but inside each of these types, so there's an example like the if node, um, it would then call the parser class again, and then parse all the children of that, and then connect everything back together. One of the other um, tools I used was GraphFits. It's an open source, open source library um, that makes uh, making graphs really easy. You can just do something really simple like uh, you define a graph um, and then you just you just define hello and an arrow to world and then output that is a is a PNG and you, you've got that. So it's super simple. I ended up using there's a right now, but there's a Ruby wrapper library around this that makes it a tiny bit easier uh, for, uh, for setting this up. Kind of the, the nomenclature for this domain is there are the nodes, uh, which represent these, the uh, hello is a node, and then there's the edge, which is the, the connecting line. Um, yeah, so let me get into another example here. Okay, so here's a fun example. Uh, puts hello if if the time dot if, if today is basically Tuesday, and so we can see that um, that got parsed into into that first kind of it's a decision node, and then um, we have the if node, and that goes to two different branches: true and false. False is kind of it's not really there; it's implicit. So there's and then the true goes to puts hello. The other thing, the second thing I was working on, which is actually was really hard and not completely working uh, correctly in all cases, but execution tracing. Now, what if you've got this visual representation of this flow? <coughs> what if you can then see, see what branch it takes? So today being Tuesday. But so long. Great. Oh, and I wanted to say one thing about this, just that uh, this uses uh, Ruby's trace point, uh, which basically hooks hooks into Ruby's internals. Um, every time there is uh, there's a bunch of different events uh, that it will argue about. We'll tell you the final name that happened. We'll tell you there's a method call or a line that was executed. Will basically give you, yeah, will give you the line number that's executed. Uh, but for example, like this thing, uh, there's actually multiple segments of code that can be executed on that one line. So that makes it really ambiguous about what was actually executed. So I had to do some work where um, basically just using the parser gem, I could take the parser gem, parse it to an AST, and there's also another gem called unparser, which puts it back into Ruby. You lose some of your original formatting, but what that does is it actually uh, put the code on uh, from being a one-liner to being a multi-liner, which actually helps me in this case. All right, here's another example. This shows how it does method pressing, uh, referencing, uh, so we actually have multiple graphs that are kind of linked together. And so we've got the, the start method here. It's like a pointer or something, but. Um, yeah, so we've got the, the start method and it uh, does if hungry and that checks the stomach to see if it's, if it's hungry. And the result of that is we have the true false branch where we eat or work. That's kind of cool. Uh, visually, it might not be perfect, but it might be how you want to rate your code. So, another thing that I worked on was inlining local methods. 
this reads a bit better. Uh, so we just got to agree something is empty. Should we work? Great. Um, so what this does is um, the code looks up. So we have we have a send. So this hungry becomes a send node. Um, uh, sending it hungry. And so we look up, we have a multi, uh, basically have a, a hash of all the different methods that are local to this that we're parsing in. And we look that up. If we find that, I can replace the body of the that hungry with the uh, with the actual method call. So that's kind of cool. It kind of cleans, cleans it up, and uh, uh, occasionally that might be what you want. So here's some really uh, messy code. You guys might have seen this. Uh, Sandy Metz has done a talk on this. This is the Gilded Rose. It's kind of like a refactoring exercise uh, that you may have done. I did it for a job interview once. Uh, it's really nested if statements. Um, that's not really, really what's important, but I use this as um, kind of like a, a a test to, to see if my code was really recursive, and it, could it take this and produce a graph that's, uh, that's meaningful? And it can. Um, oh. Oh. Yeah. Scroll down there. <laughs> okay. And also, you can't. You probably can't see this, but at the bottom there's there's a link. I have a website that you can actually you can see the code. And you can see the, the resulting graph. I'll, I'll show you guys that at the end. Um, yeah, so the next thing is what if we could show execution through this? Show you that next. Uh, yeah, so we have uh, the green nodes, originally it's right down the middle there, but um, the green nodes are the ones that were executed, and it puts a number on each node and edge. Uh, or the set number, because sometimes if you're kind of looping around or calling things multiple times, you can't quite follow it. Let's just uh, all that down. You can say we end up all the way end on step 23. That's kind of cool. So it doesn't show you, uh, you know, state or anything like that. Uh, but it can, you know, visually, you know, rep it can represent your code in a different way. Uh, maybe use a different part of your brain um, if you're trying to understand something that's complex in your system. Uh, I think this could be really cool. Let's see. I'm just throwing out another example. This was actually an example that's slightly modified from Renew Financial, about like a high high level method. That this was kind of my first test. Um, if the uh, uh, so this was a, uh, a decision rule to see if somebody, uh, their mortgage, uh, was in a good standing. And so if, if there was, if we didn't have the data we returned available, for some reason we couldn't gather the mortgage, it was an exception. Um, and then if they had a bad history, we went straight to decline. And then another kind of history check, we went to decline. And if that's good, we check some other things. That can be an exception. And finally, if we're good at the end, we're approved. Um, something else this shows is that I don't have the code to show with this one, but if you can see it, that decline right there is um, it's used. It's uh, it has two different places that it has a string decline. Uh, but what I've done is I I merge together the the nodes that are uh, have the same text. Uh, so you can just point to the same thing, and that logically just makes more sense. The other one is just a looping exercise. Uh, so we looped around, we'll call paint the town, we'll return hello. And so here's just an example of how you would use my gem. Um, and then we'll get to what it looks like on the other side. Um, so we just kind of, we open up Visualize Ruby, open up a block, and um, <coughs> Pass the Ruby code. It needs to be. It needs to, in the end, be some type of string we can get to, uh, either a string of file or path name or something. So we have to actually have uh, the isolated context of 
what we're parsing, um, so we can throw throw the string into the parser down. But then we have separated out the trace code. So that's what we're going to be. We're actually calling the code that you're introspecting. So here we're just calling looping new, and we're going to call that method. And then finally, there's the output path. Uh, this is kind of uh, the implementation of the uh, the graphviz wrapper library I'm using. Um, but basically, you just you just give it um, your name and uh, a media extension, and it, it will it knows most of them, so it will just it'll just output whatever format you want. So this part, uh, we can see it executes the steps. Get um, kind of confusing here because we're just going around and around. The hard to follow. We can see that it was called five times there and there. That's pretty cool. You kind of visualize visualize these loops. Yeah, then there is, so this is the website I was telling you about. Um, needs some, uh, some styling help, but um, yeah, basically, yeah, you just, you, just, you can just type in live code right there, and you'll see a live update here. There's a few options you can kind of change around to, um, to get what you want, and you can also, like, if there's multiple methods, those represent actually different graphs. If you just want to hone in on one single graph, you can do that too. As long as they're not inter referencing each other. So, this is uh, another thing this is kind of cool for is if you're actually just wanting to, maybe you didn't start with Ruby code, maybe you're just thinking how to process, and rather than learning uh, the graph is dot language or something, you can just like scribble down some Ruby code. It doesn't even have to work, it can just be like, just like this. I mean, this, this code doesn't really, uh, all the, the methods aren't uh, really linked to something, but in the end it produces this. So if you're just kind of sketching out a graph really easily, you can do it in the language that you know, Ruby. So this is just kind of an open call. If anybody wants, if anybody thinks this is kind of a cool idea and you want to help out, make it better, there's uh, definitely uh, things that could be betterly uh, visualized, or yeah, nodes that I've skipped or error cases or stuff like that. So this is kind of open, uh, you know, definitely use documentation, uh, pull requests, uh, you know, whatever. Yeah, again, this is Visualize Ruby. You can, um, got a website, DustinSlicer.com. I've got, usually posted all my open source stuff. I've got a few videos up there. Uh, yeah, and then there's there's kind of the last thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I'm like, I, this is my first time ever saying Ruby code, like ever. Um, so if you don't, so there's no like. Elif or Elton commands, and also like you have to put end of the thing, otherwise it's going to do like a continuous loop and crash the system. Um, so there are else ifs. I just didn't put any of those. That's just L E L S I F is usually how you do that. And yeah, uh, the difference between Python is you know it's uh, it's basically uh, intent indentation based. This, yeah, you have to put you have to put it into row. It'll be a syntax error, and your program won't run. Thanks. Have uh, you had any major epiphanies from running some of your code through this? Um, not yet, yet, because mainly the so I've been kind of. Off work since June, and this is the, uh, the only code I've really been working on. Um, but I can definitely see it helping in the future. Uh, you know, uh, working at a company trying to solve these problems, just kind of uh, throwing this in here, and uh, you know, either you know, just helping myself better internalize, explaining it to someone else, technical or even non-technical, adding it to a presentation. Uh, See all those things. Um, when you do the coloration, I'm sorry, 
Is it a color you call that execution trace? Or what's that again? The color tracing on the branches to show which one you're actually most viable. That, like, when you did the green, also maybe if you could, like, um, if there's a way to, like, in the future, like, do, like, different colors, so, like, different parts of a program, and you can, like, visualize not just, like, one code block, but, like, the whole, the whole, like, program. And also, like, um, I have one more thought, but, like, I really like what you're doing here. And I was wondering if there's, like, a pattern in recognition that you can somehow gleam at some point, or, like, a schema that, like, arises from different types of programs, so, like, mm -hmm. it'll look with the same number of branches or look at certain, like, the nodes will form, like, a certain shape, like, a structure. But I think that this is like a really cool gem, and that's impressive that you made it yourself. That's probably like way too many nights where you're like you're going to sleep, and you're like uh, awake or something. I don't know if you're yeah. 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 yeah, there was a few things when I was making this presentation, like oh that doesn't work. I gotta fix that. Um, <laughs> yeah, but just uh, I don't know, maybe you want me to like re-explain the execution again. Um, or, or something if you could elaborate on it one day. We're like I don't know if that's um, even possible, but like. Um, so if you're looking at one code block, you can see like you have like uh, this many options, but you go down this, you trace one path, right? This is what it, it executes, and that's where it ends up. But if you can do like uh, not just one code block, but the whole like the whole program, and maybe this one code block will be green, this other one will be yellow, and the other one will be orange, and so on and so forth. If that was something you were thinking of doing one day, or if that's even possible. Yeah, I, I think maybe what you're saying is like. Uh, just iterate all the possible combinations of code paths. Is that is that kind of where you're going? I think so. Yeah, okay. different color options. I think it helped, like especially people who don't know coding. I think it can help a lot with trying to explain what you're doing or what happens when. Yeah. So I, I guess I could see. Let's say um, you know if you went back to that gilded rose example, we could go back to that, but. Um, But um, yeah, so if, if what you could do is if you could have multiple tracing calls that you call to this, and basically you define a color. So so in this example, yeah, do a green. In this example, do a yellow, and then merge those together. That's what you're saying. Yeah, I think I can see some use for that. Uh, that would be awesome. Um, could I throw this in a controller? This like trace around some method that I don't understand, and would it uh, would it like fall through all the code and show me all the uh, possible options? Yeah, that would be nice. It would. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, right now. I focused it just on, um, you know, just just a group of methods that um, are in a single file. Okay. Um, it's usually like a, a class um, that you're kind of interacting with, um, but there's no reason it couldn't be expanded to showing interactions between uh, files. Uh, it, it becomes a little bit of a problem just kind of figuring out. Okay, so you're doing a method call. Instead of analyzing that to figure out, oh, where does that, where does that method call go? Uh, you can figure it out if you're running the program, but if you're just static looking at it, a method call could go to many different, uh, many different places. So that makes it a little more complicated, um, but it's somewhat possible. Awesome. Back. Anyway, um, so two questions. One, does it work on itself? Like, can you run it on itself? Oh, good question. Um, <laughs> no, I haven't. Yeah, so, well, that's a good. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't have the code. But to be honest, we just got this computer, but. Um, yeah, I could throw it in there. Um, I, I would just be curious because I mean most Ruby programs use like a wire, wire relative, sometimes even like load or you know some type 
auto loading. Yeah. So you don't always know like what's going to run when you split it a lot statically. Yeah. And so the execution trace stuff is really cool because then you, you see how your program actually behaves. Um, so I was just curious. Uh, and then the other thing is that Ruby, I mean, so Rubinius and JRuby, they both had a just in time compiler for a little while, which does this kind of execution tracing, uh, tracking, I would say execution tracking. Uh, and I've heard, I haven't heard anything about it in a while, but I've heard that like C Ruby or whatever you want to call it, MRI, is going to have like a just in time compiler. In fact, I think it already does, as long as you can pull it into something. Uh, have you given any thought, or is there anything in the, uh, not D-Trace, but whatever you're using? Trace point. Uh, trace point, thank you. Uh, is there anything, any hooks in that that you could use for the execution tracing stuff to kind of get more information about what's happening in the just in time compiler? I'm not saying you do that now, but I'm just wondering if you thought about that. Yeah, I'm not sure how the just in time compiler would uh, necessarily change anything in the execution, uh, but you can definitely get a lot of information from uh, looking at the trace point and seeing where things are going. And um, there's actually another gem. Um, it's a little bit different than this, but it takes what um, it takes what trace point does and throws out a graph. Uh, it's, um, it just kind of shows, oh, this, this event happened, this method call happened, and this thing, this thing happened, and this thing happened. And so it just highlights the things that happened. Uh, what, I guess what you don't get is the things that didn't get executed or didn't, or didn't happen. Um, that's what the static analysis does. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if you get anything extra from the just in time or, or not. How, how fast does it run? Um, it's, it's pretty fast because uh, I got it on the. Let me, let me see if I can show. Uh, let me show you guys the website and uh, I can kind of show you how fast it goes. Yeah, so here's that. Example, and I can't grab anything, I don't know. Uh, but if I just change something, you can see that was pretty fast. Yeah. So, nice. the other thing you do is you just download a bunch of different formats and stuff here, too. Another thing I've done is um, uh, like the dump format and like the SVG format, you can import those in some programs. Um, Kind of manipulate it, rearrange things, change things slightly to uh, better fit what you need. So that's kind of cool. All right. Thank you. Thanks.